Okay, well, well, welcome to another episode of the Scriptural Mormonism podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Robert Barlow. In terms of announcements, this Saturday I will have an interview with Jacob Vidreen on Joseph Smith's theology of the then future reinstitution of animal sacrifice. It's based on his two journal articles in One Eternal Round, and we'll be discussing Ezekiel 40 to 48 and other Old and New Testament texts, as well as Joseph Smith's teachings on this issue. Also, Friday week, I will be interacting with uh, on another podcast on whether Joseph Smith's earliest Christology was that of modalism. Um, so that will be hosted on my YouTube page as well as a new YouTube page uh, by Stephen Murphy, a fellow from Northern Ireland. Uh, so be on the outlook for that. Um, it will be good uh, practice for my forthcoming debate against Alan, Adam Stokes on this same issue as well. Um, Today's guest is, although he's from England, and we won't hold that against him because I'm Irish, um, <laughs> it's Joseph Lowell. You probably know him best from the LDS Philosophy YouTube page, uh, and today we will be discussing Reformed Presuppositional Apologetics, which is a bit of a mouthful, but hopefully by the end of this discussion, you'll know what it is, and you'll know by what standard you should critique it. <laughs> uh, Joseph, uh, thank you for coming on. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, before we kind of discuss this uh, very interesting uh, topic, how about you give a general overview of who you are? Like, um, where you, uh, who are you, where are you from, what's your education, and what are your main uh, scholarly uh, interests? Sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Joseph Lawal, as you said. I'm um, born in, in Manchester originally, but my family's moved all over. So I'm in, I'm in Connecticut now. Um, I'll be starting my PhD in philosophy in the fall. Um, my interests are mainly in, in contemporary philosophy, kind of philosophy of language, metaphysics, epistemology, that sort of thing. I've um, got some interest in history of Latter-day Saint philosophy, um, and then in, in philosophy of religion generally, especially contemporary philosophy of religion. So that's kind of where, partly where my interest in presuppositionalism um, stem from. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's an approach to religion that has a lot of philosophical commitments. Right? And with respect to your uh, forthcoming dissertation, any idea what topic uh, you'll hopefully uh, zoom in on for that? Uh, not totally sure. I mean, I, I, I did an undergrad um, honors thesis on on Hilary Putnam and um, kind of the intersection of his, of his theory of reference and metaphysics and epistemology, um, kind of his critique of a priority and that sort of thing, analyticity. And I, um, uh, if, I if I were, you know, pressed to say, I, I'm not going to start the thesis for another two years, but um, um, a dissertation, uh, that's probably what I would guess it'll be about, but we'll see. <laughs> well, I look forward to reading it. I'm sure no matter what the topic, it will be very interesting. And of course, you run the uh, LDS Philosophy YouTube page, and you've had some debates and some discussions, including one with my friend Tark LaCour on it, as well as, um, I believe Blake Oster was on it as well. He's not been yet, but I, I will at some point. I mean, he's, he's our best philosopher, so I've got oh. to have him on, on a channel de dedicated to Latter-day Saint philosophy. He's got to be out there at some point. Well, yeah, uh, no, Blake's good, and he, he'll um, he always comes on podcasts. So, uh, but he did have one, a very good one, on um, with Tarek Lacour uh, as well, who's a uh, mutual friend of ours and mm -hmm. the past guest. Uh, Tarek came on to discuss the priesthood and temple restriction, and hopefully we'll have him on again to discuss um, some other issues as well, including um, determinism and um, other topics like the B theory of time. Um, okay, so today's discussion is actually on the topic of reformed presuppositional apologetics. Um, now, this is a very interesting type of uh, epistemology and approach to apologetics that Latter-day Saints rarely ever encounter unless, of course, they're online and encounter certain strands of uh, Reformed or Calvinistic theology. Um, so, um, what is uh, Reformed presuppositional apologetics? Uh, before we kind of delve into, like, critiquing it and analyzing it, what is it and why do you think it's important that Latter-day Saints and others should actually be aware of it? Yeah, so it's it's an approach i mean very broadly it's an approach to christianity and to knowledge claims within kind of the tr christian tradition right uh, more specifically as you say it's it's a kind of apologetics right and so it, it's it's yeah I, I would call it an approach and it, and it rests on on kind of a background of certain sets of epistemological and on, on ontological commitments really are what characterize what presuppositionalism is and epistemology relates to theories of knowledge and truth and, and ontology relates you know to, to the nature of being and so it's it's commitments in in how we know things and what exists essentially is what i'm saying when i say that it rests on epistemological and ontological claims um but it's also a claim about how apologetics ought to be done based on those epistemological and ontological claims primarily epistemological so um you'll hear it often contrasted with 
so-called classical or evidential apologetics, right? So the, the, the claim there for an evidentialist, so you, so you might see someone like William Lane Craig is kind of a, a paradigm, paradigmatic uh, evidentialist. So his, his kind of case for Christianity is he'll start with uh, basically claims that, that theists and non-theists can agree on, right? So he'll say, uh, you know, we can, we can reason together about certain things in reality. So he'll, he'll present, present, say the Kalam argument, right? He'll say, um, it's impossible for the past to be infinite. And if that's the case, then there must be a God that created the universe out of nothing, right? Uh, that, that's, that's kind of a big picture idea of the Kalam. And so, and so all of these are claims that can be agreed upon by, by theists and non-theists. You, you could, in theory, agree upon the fact that the past could be infinite. And so he wants to take this neutral ground. He wants to give you an argument to show that God exists. And then he'll go from there and try to show that um, it's more likely than not that Christianity is you know, the best account of reality, right? So he'll maybe give a, a case for the resurrection, a historical case of the resurrection, right? He says, we can agree on the historical facts and the best explanation for those historical facts is that Jesus rose from the dead. The best explanation of Jesus rising from the dead was that he was divine. So he'll start on neutral ground and he'll say, he'll try to get you to come towards the Christian position with certain arguments. The presuppositionalist, um, kind of what marks the difference there between evidentialists and, and presuppositionalists is that they don't think that there is neutral ground to be arguing from at all. They think you have to presuppose Christianity all, at all times. And we'll get more into that in detail as what that looks like. And so then just to give kind of a, a, a sweep of, of how it came about and, and, and who the big names are, um, kind of the, the big people you'll hear talked about in presuppositionalist circles are uh, Cornelius Van Til, who is really the founder. And then he had two students, uh, Greg Barnson and John Frame, and they kind of constitute one school, so to speak. It's kind of loosely termed as a school of, of presuppositional apologetics. So Van Til, Barnson, and Frame, and then you have Gordon Clark, who started writing in the fifties. Uh, Van Til was in the twenties, and he had his student John Robbins, and they're kind of another school of presuppositional apologetics. Um, but that's that's so it's, it's it, you know it's 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 about a hundred years old. This this tradition of uh, approach to um, apologetics and Christianity and as you said it's it's really a, it's it's a reformed thing and it's an online thing right so you'll see it used primarily by Calvinists and again primarily online and so so one thing to, to note and I, I don't I don't mean this in a disparaging way it's not particularly an academic thing so you're not going to see for instance academic philosophers for the most part endorsing presuppositionalism it's not a live option for hardly any so it, you know it's it's published about so for instance Anderson and Welty have a paper in Philosophia Christi um, called the Lord of Non-Contradiction, arguing for kind of a presuppositional approach to, um, you know, uh, the laws of logic, essentially. Um, but Philosophia Christi is is a, a, a journal put out by the, um, the Evangelical Philosophy Philosophical Society. I forget the exact name. It's, it's through Biola, so it's, it's 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 kind of it's an evangelical kind of apologetics journal, right? And it's it's um, so it's it's not a, it's it's it is. And again, I don't mean this in a disparaging way. That it obviously this doesn't speak to the truth conditions by itself. It's an online kind of Calvinist thing. It's not like a, a big, big in because apologetics, philosophy, religion. It's 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 there in the kind of academic scene. And presuppositionalism, frankly, isn't really. It's a it's kind of a YouTube, Facebook kind of thing. Well, you mentioned like how it or um, how Van Til and others were like main figures behind it. Does it actually have a strong historical pedigree, or like is it relatively speaking a very novel? approach to apologetics and epistemology so there, i think there are certainly seeds of it in calvinism or reformed circles kind of before van til came on the scene right a lot of the kind of core uh notions well okay so so there's kind of the philosophical side and there's kind of the, the much more theological side so it's like um presuppositionalists you'll often hear them say things like uh, there are no true atheists right um uh if you think that you don't believe in God, you're fooling yourself essentially, and that's got a longer pedigree than, than just the 1920s, right? Um, and and but that that is, I think, linked closely tied up with the kind of reasoning that that Van Til tried to instigate. And then you know, and then Van Til is relying on transcendental arguments, which I will explain what those are. Uh, but that certainly has a longer history, right? Um, Kant uh, famously had a transcendental argument for the existence of God, and and presuppositionalists are going to try to draw on that tradition as well but as far as like a coherent cohesive movement I, I, I as far as i can tell it really did start with van Til. okay so while one may find like say some strands here and there like seeds if you will like say total depravity and yeah other things like that so there's no true atheist everyone knows uh that there's god maybe even the triune god right um not simply like a generic unitarian concept of god at the same time like uh, the whole kid and caboodle if you will uh, being put together is really like a modern 
relatively speaking, notion. You're not going to find it saying the patristic era explicated. Right. You're going to find in the medieval period explicated. The full-fledged flowering, if you will, of this is really like a late 19th, early 20th century at best, historically speaking. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think a sophisticated presuppositionalist is going to deny that. I think it really, I think it's pretty well recognized that this is a Vantillian thing, right? So like yeah. earlier 1920s, besides some of the, you know, the kind of especially Calvinist theological commitments that existed already. Yeah, I ask because like uh, the, I know Joshua Shuping at one time was an Eastern Orthodox. I was referred to Reformed theology. He basically tried to argue in a monograph that Irenaeus was a proto presuppositionist. Hmm. Um, but at the same time, even like allowing for Irenaeus, that seems to be in the Patristic era an anomaly. It's it's not until like yeah, the I, Reformed period that you come across uh, right. proper presuppositionalism, if you will. Yeah, so certainly the way it looks now is not anything like it would have looked like in, in any in a, any era before Ventil. Yeah, yeah. Of course, that doesn't mean like ipso facto it's wrong, but at the same time, sure. it does kind of show if you're interested in, like, say, a historical pedigree for your philosophy and your theology, and many high church Protestants who are reformed would look to history and even certainly. the patristics and medievals. It's like it is kind of a, a bit precarious that this is like a relatively speaking a novel uh, flowering, if you will, of all these seeds, if you will. Sure, that might be a, an uncomfortable admission for some, yeah. Well, yeah, unless Kirsty wanted to bully John Henry Newman and say, like, uh, it, philosophy develops, uh, godly philosophy develops, <laughs> it's like doctrine develops, but I'm not sure if they would want to, like, uh, give one to the uh, papists on this. <laughs> <laughs> because they tend to be very anti Catholic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they do, that's true. So, um, okay, so that's, like, the background to it. Um, so, how is it used? You know, um, where is it used and how is it used? Mm hmm. Yeah, so uh, as I said, it is, it is, and again, I, I really, I want to emphasize that I don't mean this in a disparaging way, but it is, it is really mostly kind of an online phenomenon. Obviously, you know, Ventil was publishing books that, 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 that didn't exist at that point, but today, where you come across it, it will almost exclusively be in kind of online reformed circles and like kind of, you know, Christian debate groups. Um, and so the, the, the basic idea is that, um, well, may, maybe I should explain what a transcendental argument is because that really is the core of, of the kind of notion of presuppositionalism and then we can get into some of the ancillary kind of claims so essentially um a transcendental argument makes a claim of the form um x is a next necessary presupposition for y or y necessarily presupposes x um y obtains or exists therefore x um, so it's, it's a kind of modus ponens argument if if uh y than x right but uh, it's, it's of a specific sub form right where something is a necessary precondition for something else and therefore if, if the um latter exists the former must <laughs> so that's confusing so give, let me give an example so um this is a totally uncontroversial example right um energy is a necessary precondition for heat you can't have heat without energy so if you come across heat in the world then you know the energy has been expended there that's that's um because heat can't exist without energy you you can you can you're licensed in concluding that but that's an a posteriori example right that's based on a sense experience generally transcendental arguments are a priori right you're going to try to argue this kind of without relying on um too much in the world we, we only know because of scientific investigation for instance that heat presupposes energy and they're, they're going to tend to try to rely on things that you can kind of know a priori or you, it's claimed you can know a priori um so uh, they're often anti-skeptical arguments, right? Uh, the skeptic is going to make a certain claim. Oh, well, actually, you have to presuppose something that defeats your position in order to, to make that claim, that skeptical claim coherently, right? So transcendental arguments kind of famously are associated with Kant and, and um, Peter Strawson. Uh, Putnam has transcendental arguments. And you sometimes hear that Descartes in his cogito, that I think, therefore, I am, is a transcendental argument. I think it's not right, not, not an accurate characterization of Descartes, although you could rewrite that argument as a transcendental argument. And then you hear uh, Barry Stroud as a famous kind of critic of transcendental arguments that you'll hear kind of philosophically informed presuppositionalists mention those names. Um, so so that's, that's the idea is that um, in order to explain certain features of reality, we have to, we're, we're all, by, by, by admitting those things exist, we're already committed to admitting certain other things. And, and, and the presuppositionalist specifically is gonna argue in order to account for, say, morality, laws of logic, reason, um, order in the universe, we have to presuppose the Christian God. That's that's the basic thrust of the presuppositionalist line, right? So if, if you want to say that the laws of logic obtain, if you want to use logic in your reasoning as an atheist, let's say, or as a Latter-day Saint, um, they're going to say, actually, that claim that you can use reason is going to be inconsistent with your pre presuppositions with your with your commitments that come prior to that because in order to explain logic or reason or whatever you have to um 
assume the Christian kind of orthodoxly conceived Christian God. And that's that's the basic basic thrust. I don't know if you want to make a comment there, or I can I can get into some of this kind of the the common lines you'll hear from uh, presuppositionalists that are a little bit more specific than that. Uh, no, I think that's a uh, good overview uh, because, like, the tag argument or the transcendental argument, it's very popular online. Mm-hmm. For instance, Matt Slick makes it all the time if you ever yeah. listen to him. And if you yeah. do, and there's a purgatory, that's the plenary indulgence. But, <laughs> but it, it's very popular. Now, it does appear, like, maybe here and there, like, maybe as a uh, support uh, for, like, certain things. But at the same time, it's really, as you know, like, not that it's dispersion, like it could still be correct, but it's really more of an online phenomenon, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you know, like, yes, they have published books, but like since the 70s and 80s, a somewhat bastardized form is very popular on the internet, like the Saitin, Bergen, Kate, Man mm-hmm. Slick right. approach to presuppositionalism. Uh, so, no, that's good. Um, but I'll let you continue, but like uh, one topic maybe we should discuss is like uh, logic. Like, how do you justify and ground logic? If you're not a presuppositionist, and maybe yeah. how can you do it if you're a Latter-day Saint as well? But I'll let you continue. Sure. So, so yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit more of an overview of the sorts of um, things you'll hear from presuppositionists, and then we can get into kind of problems and responses and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, yeah, that's definitely something we should, we should get into. So yeah, the, the 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 tag argument, as you said, the transcendental argument for God, uh, is the kind of core. Um, but you'll kind of hear it cashed out in different ways. So one phrase you'll hear a lot is um, the impossibility of the contrary. This is a phrase that goes back to Van Til. And so the idea there is that uh, alternative worldviews, so the non, that you'll hear, often hear it referred to in the singular, right? So, so Van Til sets up this dichotomy. He says, I can, I can disprove every other worldview, um, not by going around and identifying each of them individually and disproving them individually, because that would be impossible because there's infinitely many in that sense, right? We could, we could make all sorts of ad hoc changes to worldviews to make a different worldview. He says there's really two worldviews. There's the, the one that says the Christian God exists, the one that says it doesn't, right? And so he says, you know, we can kind of, if we can show in principle that you couldn't have one that doesn't have the Christian God, then we can rule out all of those ones, right? Um, and so the, the idea is that you know, you'll hear that kind of that idea expressed as the impossibility of the contrary. Any worldview that doesn't include the Christian God is internally inconsistent right from your own starting assumptions you can't you can't derive the commitments that you want to be able to derive right? again so things like the existence of morality order in the universe intelligibility of the universe reason laws of logic that sort of thing and so um along with that impossible of the contrary you get the, the accusation that non-christian quote-unquote non-christian which it, which for a presuppositionist includes latter-day saints worldviews are borrowing from the christian worldview right so if you do something like employ the laws of logic to make an argument they're going to say, oh, you're borrowing from the Christian worldview. You can only make those arguments, use the laws of logic, if you're assuming the Christian worldview, though, the fundamentals of Christianity. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's illicit borrowing, right? It's, it's, the idea is that that's a bad thing if you're borrowing from the Christian worldview. Um, and then along with that, again, you'll, you'll hear a lot. It's, it's a bit of a meme, I think, as well as being uh, a serious claim by some presuppositionalists. They'll say, by what standard, right? You'll say... Uh, you know, I believe X, Y, Z, and they'll say, by what standard, right? By what standard do you believe that? And I think it's, it's like a T-shirt as well. It's a bit... <laughs> I, I don't want to come across a super disparaging video. I don't... I, I struggle to, to see how presuppositionalism can be made to be sophisticated and, and um, uh, plausible, especially along these sorts of lines when you say things like, be what, by what standard? It's not a good argument, and we can get into why. Sorry, you muted. I don't know if you're trying to. And hopefully, by what standard you can tell us by what standard you actually can. Right. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> perhaps not to the satisfaction of a of a presuppositionalist. Um, but before you can continue, like uh, there's the uh, phrase like the Christian uh, God. It should be noted, like uh, for these presuppositionalists, it's the classical Trinitarian understanding mm-hmm. of God, like ab- uh, divine simplicity at the very least, if not absolute divine simplicity. And there's a bit of yep. a difference, as you know, yep. um, but also a Trinitarian framework of God as well. So it's not like yes. some generic uh, Unitarian concept of God. It's right. actually the full fledged God of creedal Trinitarian. Of course, they'll claim it's like biblical trinitarianism but the same mm-hmm. thing what we would understand to say the nicene constantinopian chalcedonian understanding of the relationship between father son and spirit and all those kind of uh, later concepts as well that's what yes. we understand to be the christian god it's not like a generic belief in god concept. yeah thank you yeah that's a really important point and, that, and that's that's why presuppositionalism is so hostile to latter-day saints uh, so i'm glad you brought that up because um i mean so so presuppositionalism absolutely is almost exclusively not exclusively but almost exclusively a, a reformed phenomenon um but so so you know it, it it often incorporates a lot of reformed ideas like we talked about um you know 
the, the non-existence of atheists, right? Everyone really believes in God. That's that really is a kind of a Calvinist notion. Um, but if, if you're going to boil it down to the bare essentials, um, this could certainly be adopted, I think, um, by any Christian Trinitarian classical theist, as you say, because really what, what, what they're saying you have to be committed to is a certain notion of God. They, they definitely want the Trinity. Um, and that's that's kind of it, right? You have this kind of non, this impassable, um, uh, unchanging simple immaterial god and, 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 the, and then the trinitarian on top, trinitarianism on top of it that's really the, that's the core of what you need for this sort of argument and we can i'll, I'll get you know into more detail as to why why they think that is um but like just so you know like there are like eastern orthodox presuppositions right it's most right. notably online jay dyer and there's even some roman catholic presuppositionists um so this is uh, Jeremiah uh, Bannister, and he mm -hmm. works with reason and theology. So although it's a reform team, you will find like even Catholic right. and Eastern Orthodox, and in some cases, maybe even Muslim presuppositionists in some f shape or form, but like 90% plus, of course, at least those one will encounter or win the Calvinistic reformed yep. Uh, camp. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and I, again, I, this is something I want to touch on again later, but, um, the idea that Trinitarianism is essential to presuppositionalism, I think, is just flatly wrong. And so I think, yeah, sure, you could have like a, a, a Muslim presuppositionalist. And, and, you know, in principle, you could have a Latter-day Saint presuppositionalist. You just have to argue slightly differently, but just like the, the Muslim would have to argue slightly differently. Um, often you'll hear that the Trinitarianism is absolutely essential to presuppositionalism. Um, and that's just just not right. And, and, I, and I'll explain why people think that and why I think it's wrong. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the... This is this is these are the sort of things you'll hear from presuppositionalists a, a great deal, and the last one you'll hear a lot is um, to argue for God is to assume that there's some starting point more ultimate than God, right? And again, I think that's just just mistaken. But um, these are the sorts of claims that you'll hear, and so so I, I, maybe I can I can try to explain why I think. So basically, you'll hear these arguments, for the, like the transcendental argument, and the suggestion often, not always, I would say more often than not, though, is that this we can know. That this is right with absolute certainty. So presuppositionalists often see their view as being totally based on totally inexorable deductive arguments, right? These are unavoidable consequences. And so that's not how pretty much any professional philosopher approaches arguments in philosophy, right? So there's like a, like Peter Van Eeuwen has a great line about kind of disagreement in philosophy and how it's, you know, so, so often philosophers are going to think that the arguments are going to be irresolvable more or less. Um, but, you know, certainly almost all are going to, you know, kind of admit that, sure, I think my arguments are right. I think they're more likely than not. I think I have reasons as to why I, why, why I think they're right. Um, but, but it's possible to rationally believe otherwise, right? And I think, um, I mean, certainly presuppositionalists are going to take issue with saying that anyone else can be rational because they don't think reason can exist in any worldview. But the, the reason I think that there's this emphasis on like at the absolute certainty of presuppositionalism is uh, I think it actually rests on a, a conflation of, of epistemology and ontology. So this is a little bit technical. I don't, I don't want to get super technical here, but I think basically what's going on is, okay, so let's, let's, let's uh, suppose the presuppositionalist is right that say the laws of logic can't obtain, I don't want to say exist because it's kind of, a, it's kind of a weird to say that, that laws of logic exist in like a super strong sense, but the laws of logic obtain, uh, let's say they're right that they can only obtain if God exists, right? So God exists necessarily, which is to say every possible state of affairs, every possible world, as, as philosophers like to say, um, in every possible world, God exists. And um, necessarily, laws of logic depend on God, right? So without God, laws of logic couldn't exist. It's kind of weird to talk about that because God couldn't not exist on this view, but regardless, let's say that's right. So um in, in every possible world, laws of logic depend on God. God exists in every possible world. Logic exists in every possible world. If that's right, it is right to say that you couldn't have logic without God. I mean, it's, again, it's kind of weird to say because we're saying in every possible state of affairs, God exists. You couldn't not have God. But it's, it's correct, like ontologically, to say that that's correct. And so, yeah, in that sense, um, if, if they're right about the claim, you know, if logic, then God is presupposed, uh, then it's it's true it is true to say if if that's right that um you know you can't account for those laws of logic without god in in any other worldview but so the problem is that's an ontological claim that there's this link between logic and god in kind of the, the existence or obtaining of logic but it's it's different than saying that it's epistemologically or epistemically necessary that we you know, rely on God for logic. So l let's suppose that it is the case that logic actually depends on God. That doesn't entail that everyone is going to um, 
be committed to saying rationally that logic depends on God, if that makes sense. So there, there are multiple rational ways of accounting for things, even if only one of them is true. So um, it's not true that in maybe we can say every epistemically possible world, logic depends on God, even if ontologically in every metaphysically possible world it does. Again, and, and maybe this is a mistake again, because it's a little bit technical, but um, basically my point is, even if it's true that logic depends on God, that doesn't mean it's certain that logic depends on God, because we can be wrong about things that exist in reality, and we can be wrong in ways that are rational and defensible, right? So the, cert the kind of claim that this is an absolutely certain deductive argument relies on saying that the, the premises in the argument are absolutely certain, right? So like the claim that logic depends on God, that we would have to be able to, unable to give a rational account that's an alter alternative to that premise, right? And it's just not true that we can't give plausible alternative accounts to that premise. We can, we can account for why we know logic in different ways, other than saying that it depends on God. In fact, I think, so like the Anderson Welty argument uh, that I referenced, the paper that I referenced earlier, this idea that um, we can show that basically the line of argument is, uh, you know, logical truths are necessary truths, and they're actually thoughts. Um, and in order for these necessary thoughts to obtain, they have to be thoughts in, in a, a necessary mind, in God's mind. And it's just not a particularly compelling line of argument. It's not one that philosophers of logic are going to pretty much ever endorse today. Uh, and, and philosophers of logic are going to give all sorts of other alternative accounts of how the laws of logic obtain. I mean, it's, it's not even particularly possible to say that laws of logic are just thoughts. Uh, you know, I, I think it's not, not a particularly popular position anymore. Um, because, for instance, we have the intuition that if no minds existed, the laws of logic would still obtain. Right? <laughs> it wouldn't suddenly be true that something could be true and not true at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think th that this idea that these arguments are certain probably largely stems from a confusion of epistemology and ontology, uh, of, of thinking that because something is uh, metaphysically necessary, it's somehow therefore epistemically necessary. And that's just not the case. Okay, um, so any, how do you want to uh, uh, progress now? Because like there's so much we could discuss when it comes to presuppositionalism. Um, right. So maybe, let me, let me quickly distinguish between two types of approaches to the to the kind of argument that god has to exist we have to presuppose something um and then yeah we, we can maybe get into then problems with the view that sort of thing um that's perfect um so you'll hear two lines one of them i think is much more plausible and i think you you know you can make this argument like like anderson and wealthy i disagree i think their argument their paper is not not at all convincing um but I, I, there's all sorts of extremely sophisticated philosophical, philosophical positions that I don't find convincing, right? So I'm, I'm not going to begrudge someone for, for making that sort of argument. But so that there's that, that kind of that, that line, right, that we, we take some feature of reality, like logic, reason, morality, and you're going to argue that, that God has, is, has to be presupposed for that. That's fine as far as it goes. Right? I disagree for the most part, but I, I'm, I'm not going to um, disparage that. There's, there's kind of a second line of thinking that I find much less plausible. In fact, I can't even really work out a particularly coherent notion of what's being said here. And this is the claim that um, in order to, you know, make sense of some particular feature of reality, it's not God we're presupposing, but it's the Bible or the kind of the biblical world. The biblical worldview, when they say that, I think they basically mean kind of certain beliefs about God. But but to say that we can't make sense of the world without the Bible, and you'll hear that, you'll, that's, that's a claim made. I think it's just nonsense, right? <laughs> it's not like people who existed before the Bible was written couldn't make sense of the world, right? Uh, uh, so you'll hear that line, but I'm not going to spend any time on it because it is just nonsense, right? I, I think sometimes people say it and they don't mean that. Other times people say that and they mean that and they're just absolutely flatly demonstrably wrong, right? Yeah, just, just uh, I know you'd be focusing on that, but I'll just like make one comment on that. Mm, sure. Even, uh, that can't be true, even to, uh, they would have to admit that's not true until like uh, the inscripturation of the final book of the Bible. Right. Uh, so it means like it can be an operative principle during the time of Christ, during the time of Moses, when special revelation, even according to their view, was still in progress and there's like yeah. old tradition and other right. sources on power. So if that's the case, ipso facto, you can't claim you must need the Bible or have a biblical worldview to actually come to this. Because yeah. if no, people I mean, could it's... come to it, if uh, people could come to it in times of special revelation, right. without right. a completed canon, you, you can't claim like that it's um, of necessity. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it genuinely is just a, an extremely puzzling position for people to take. Because you'll hear, you'll hear things like, we can't know about the law's logic without the Bible because, you know, in the Bible it says things like, uh, you know, you're either with me or against me, and they say, "Oh, that's that's the law of excluded middle. That's how we know that logical law." And it's, I mean, it's just there's so much wrong there. But or, I think I think we can see it, why yeah. that is. Or like easily. in Genesis, uh, you know, like uh, there's a comment about like um, God and how He operates with the world, and that according to Bunsen and others, it's like uh, that means like um, 
you have a Christian foundation for believing, like, say, in the, um, how laws of nature are always the same, you know, and right, right. that kind of basis for, like, an induction. It's the only way we know that we can make inductions about the future, yeah. yeah, and it's just, it's it's not good. That's a very bad way of arguing. Yeah. And, it is, and it does smack of, like, eyes of Jesus, I used to, like, reading things. Sure, text, right, uh, doubt, yeah. Like, say, the yeah. ancient interpreters of the biblical text or the original audience would have imagined this was the case. It seems to be, like, right. trying, like, oh, trying, trying to, like, say, book of Job and right. trying to, like, read, like, the rain cycle or something yeah. like back into-ish. Right. It, it, it's a stretch. You know? It is. No, I, 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 don't, I don't want to give that <laughs> that line of reasoning any more any more thought. So, so I think I... I much more plausible, much more plausible, even though I don't find it particularly plausible, is this notion that, you know, to account for laws, logic or reason or morality, we have to presuppose God, a certain notion of God. This idea that we have to be reading the Bible to make sense of the world, I think is absolute nonsense. Um, okay, so, so you know, that's that's the basic line of presuppositional lists. We, we've kind of already identified a couple of problems. I think there is some conflation sometimes of, of um, kind of epistemic and, and metaphysical modalities. Um, I think another significant problem for the for the set of claims. So, so the idea is that you can go from certain features of reality, like logic or reason, and you can get from that a Christianity using like the tag, right? I think it doesn't get you far enough, right? So even it, let's let's say it's right. Let's say the transcendental argument is right. You can't have logic without um, the existence of uh, a God that has certain attributes that has, say that has a mind, disembodied, necessary, uh, maybe impassable. Uh, well, probably not impassable, but like unchanging. Um, so sure, let's grant that tentatively. How far does that get you? So, so at that point, it looks like it's it's not going to decide between, certainly between different uh, sects within Christianity, and probably not between certain uh, kind of models of Judaism and Islam, right? If, if you have kind of a relatively classical monotheism, it looks like you can get all that. So why do many, perhaps most presuppositionalists insist that you need the Trinity? Well, Generally, what they'll do is they'll give the tag. They'll say, in order to account for logic or reason or the intelligence of the world, you have to presuppose God. And then they'll say, and this is from Van Til, this is why they get this. One of the perennial problems of philosophy is the problem of the one and the many. Since the Greeks, and then all the way down today, it's just like philosophers have been grappling with this, the central problem of philosophy. Um, and, you know, how do you account for the problem of the one? And the many? So, so basically, you know, how do you account for multiplicity and unity in the world? How do we account for both those things? And they say, oh, well, the Trinity, because it's three in one. And so we've solved that problem. And you get you get trinitarianism for free, you know, because it solves that problem, and and and, and that's why I say I, I it just doesn't make sense to me to claim that uh, trinitarianism trinitarianism is essential to presuppositionalism, because the problem of one of many the many is just a separate thing, right? So like let's let's set aside for now the bizarre claim that historically it's been the perennial problem of philosophy because it just hasn't. And also, basically, no one who's not doing history of philosophy and presuppositionalism is writing about that today in, in contemporary philosophy, um, but. It, it, it is just a separate thing, right? It's not, it's not part of the tag. You're given the tag, and then you're saying there's the separate problem of one of the many, um, uh, and, the, and the Trinity solves that. So, uh, so sure, like you, can, you, can, you can give those two arguments together, but it's just not true that presuppositionalism you know, essentially includes Trinitarianism because you're just adding on the separate philosophical problem that you think you're solving with the Trinity um, you know, in addition to the tag argument you've already given. So, so that's, that's why I think plausibly you could say that you know, not only Calvinists have to be presuppositionalists, you could be a non-Trinitarian. And as long as you have a certain kind of vaguely classical conception of God, you know, that, that works. You can do presuppositionalism. Um, so, so the second problem with, with this kind of Trinitarian th Trinitarianism thing, this kind of gap between um, the, the tag argument or the kind of basic presuppositionalist line and uh, Christianity, because the Trin Tr if you get Trinitar Trinitarianism, sure, like you roughly have Christianity at that point, um, you know, I'm happy to admit that that like if 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 the tag argument is right, and if the this solution to the problem of the one of the many is most likely, that's evidence for Christianity specifically because Christianity is kind of the, the main live option for most people that says that we have this kind of three in one. But the idea, and this is why it's important that these are actually separate issues: the tag and the and the problem of the one of the many. What presuppositionists have generally trying to do is conclusively rule out all possible alternatives, right? So they're trying to say the only possible worldview is the Christian one. And again, this is kind of specifically Trinitarian classical one. And the problem is that that claim is too strong for what the argument can be doing, right? Because you can't rule out in principle all alternatives 
if you have to be relying on the problem of the one and the many, this, this particular solution, to try to rule out these alternatives. Because the, the factor of three in one is not essential to this solution to the problem of the one and the many. If all you're trying to say is that the solution depends on there being multiplicity in one, you could have a binitarian view of God. You could have just the father and the son, say. And that would be equally not ruled out, right, by uh, the, this, this kind of tag presupposition just line. Uh, and so it's now a live option compared to Christianity. So let's say a, a, a religion arises that says there's 101, this, this, this you know, <laughs> very complex view of, of God where there's 100 persons in one being, and then it has this, you know, whatever, all sorts of other uh, claims. Maybe it's roughly Christian, but it, it happens to say that. that. Now, that view is equally plausible, according just to the presuppositionist line, to the presuppositionist, um, to his own position, right? Um, and, and so that's not enough. Basically, the, the presuppositionist is always going to want to say that they can rule out all alternatives, and you can't if you're relying on the problem of the one and the many, because because there's no reason to think that, that a trinitarian view is the only way that can solve. So, so if you're trying to say that in principle we can rule out all alternatives, you can't do that. I think essentially is, is my point. Uh, and so there's a gap problem. Again, I'm, I'm not saying that it's not evidence for uh, trinitarian Christianity, because if these arguments go through, sure, that is like the one that's currently live, but you, you can't make them the much stronger claim that you've conclusively ruled out all alternatives. Um, so that's, that's maybe that's a minor problem. Uh, it, it, it certainly is not something that many presuppositionists want to admit, but it's, it is, um, I think, virtually unavoidable. It's just not true that the problem of the one of the many is going to get you to specifically Trinitarianism, right? So you can't rule out all possible alternatives, as, as, as Van Til tried to do. Um, yeah, okay, so so then you, you said you wanted uh, maybe uh, a sketch of how left saints can accept logic. Uh, yeah, but without... before we do, maybe like um, one question that comes up, and I often know this as well, is like, how does the presuppositionist actually know that they know? Because it seems like if you're reformed, you believe in total depravity, even if you feign religiosity in their view, um, you know, you're a god-hater prior to conversion, even if you're one of the elect, you're still totally depraved until mm -hmm. you're uh, effectually called and regenerated and sanctified. So it seems like, although they will poo-poo this for Latter-day Saints, they seem to like, um, they seem to uh, know that they know, if you will, through like a spiritual witness of their own from God or some type of divine revelation. You know, if you're familiar with the Protestant conception of, say, the internal witness of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. some explicating, say, reformed creeds, like, um, the uh, second uh, hell, um, well, the Westminster Confession of Faith and a few other confessions of faith as well. Um, it, it seems to me like sometimes, if they're honest, like they'll have to say, like, well, God told them in some way, as opposed to they reasoned their way into like reformed theology and also pre yeah, yeah. So uh, that's certainly uh, one way that they can go, and I think it, it maybe maybe more plausible <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, and I have, I will say, I have heard presuppositionists kind of appeal to that in the final analysis. But I think many will want to deny that's what's going on, right? I think, uh, yeah, regardless of whether they can coherently do so, they're going to want to say that they just do have this really strong deductive argument that is ruling it out, and they know that they know because, I don't know. Well, I mean, you know, first of all, this is kind of an open question in philosophy: Do you have to know that you know in order to know? Uh, and I don't know. Maybe they can deny that they know that they know, but they, they, they just they know, uh, or you know, they can give some account of 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 why it's plausible for them to accept the, 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 the kind of logical inferences that are accepting. But I think you're right, there's a tension there if you're saying that, that there's this depravity that, uh, and th again, this is, this is a very, I guess, maybe broadly Protestant, but specifically Calvinist uh, line, that, that you have your reason dampened by, by sin, yeah, right? So yeah, like, if we're depraved, yeah. we... we yeah, yeah, yeah like the noetic effects of the fall, even after you're yeah, exactly. regenerated yeah. and sanctified, you're still morally and epistemologically fallen, even, even once you're regenerated. That's an yeah. ongoing process of sanctification. So, like, your reasoning skills are still diminished, even once you're effectually called in their... Yeah, opinion. right, and, and that's why it's that's why it's fair to, to call into question, how do you know that you know? Because, so, you know, there's, there's always skeptical arguments, kind of global skeptical arguments to say, you know, so, like, uh, uh, like famously, uh, Descartes with his dreaming skepticism, right? How do you know that you're looking at? How do I know I'm looking at a computer right now? Uh, I could be dreaming, and then in that case, I wouldn't be looking at a computer, right? So, if you know, and and then often the response to skeptical arguments is to say, well, unless I have some positive reason to think that's the case, I don't have to worry about my knowledge, right? So, so um, present to me some reason to think that I am currently dreaming, and if I have reason to think that I'm currently dreaming, then then I can worry about whether I can make my knowledge claims like that I'm looking at a computer right now. But you're right that, but if you introduce this notion of the, the noetic effects of the fall, um, you do have positive reason to think that your reasoning isn't good. You have now reason to call into question whether you know certain things, right? So, like, am I am I interpreting or relying on the laws of logic correctly? Well, now I guess I don't know because it may, maybe the noetic effects of the fall are, 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 are you know 
making it such that I have certain false beliefs about logic or I'm, I'm you know, misconstruing this argument or something, right? So, so there's, there's a tension there, right? That's, that's, that's not a super comfortable claim to make epistemically, the, this claim that, 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 you know, the fall had these effects on our ability to reason um, because it calls it a question your conclusions, right? And so, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a tension. I, you know, I, I, I haven't heard this discussed by presuppositionalists at length. Maybe there are some, you know, there will be more plausible and less plausible responses. Um, so I don't, I don't want to say this like totally defeats the position, but it's, there's certainly a tension there. It's, it's, it's not a super comfortable thing to be saying. Yeah. And like, uh, you kind of see like how some, not all, but like at least some are uncomfortable when asked like, well, how, um, how do you come to this? Or like, um, for instance, there was a debate between, um, Jacob Hansen and Hayden Carl against two Protestant, reformed Protestants, yeah. uh, Dunlap and Constantino. And one of the, uh, um, the Latter-day Saints and under Granted, I am biased, but like, um, mm -hmm. I think any unbiased person like Sam Schmoon will actually admit this as well. And he has that the LDS won that debate. And I think like mm -hmm. the moment the debate was completely over was during the second cross eggs period, when one of, I think it was Jacob asked them, the reformed Protestants, do you interpret the Bible? And the response was no, we, uh, it was basically <laughs> they let God interpret it, uh, speak to them and stuff like that. Because I think yeah. once they recognized, uh, especially in like reform theology and the noetic effects of the fall, and even once you're regenerated and you're no longer necessarily totally depraved, but you're still fallen epistemologically, mm -hmm. once you say you interpret it, you open up to like fallibility and correction and all these other things as well. So, right. Um, that, that yeah. Mind. Yeah. And, no, I think uh, before that's right. we kind of go into like uh, the laws of knowledge, maybe like a, a word like where is the role or status of evidence for a presuppositionist? Like, say, take the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm. Now, a popular one amongst the William Lane Craig, as well as like Kona and Habermas, would be like a very evidentious view, like the minimum mm -hmm. facts he's, uh, theory, if you're familiar with that. Like, most yeah. of these scholars, even skeptics, agree there was an empty tomb, and most agree that the apostles, sometime shortly after the death of Christ, had these uh, experiences, whether visionary or, uh, in, or whatever, of the resurrected Christ, and Paul mm -hmm. was converted, and so forth. Like, the minimum facts, like the only possible explanation from an intellectual right. evidentious perspective is there was a miraculous uh, resuscitation of this messianic figure, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, Reading, like, say, Cornelius Van Til and others, like, on the resurrection, they would claim, like, uh, using evidence for a non believer is basically lying to blasphemy because you're basically putting God in the, um, the, uh, in, in, using the court analogy, like, into the defendant's box, and, like, you're letting us, like, God haters, like, make judgment on God. So, like, where is the role of evidence, like, um, uh, yeah. For a uh, presupposition as apologetic, is it more like say once you're once you're a believer, it helps you ha have greater appreciation of it, or where is the role or status of historical intellectual evidence, if you will, mm -hmm. for when a presuppositionist perspective? Because it seems to be very anti classical uh, classical evidentialist in many respects. Yes, yes. So we we touched on this in the sense that yeah, I, I distinguished. Um presuppositionalist apologetics from kind of classical and evidentialist. So yeah, you have people like William Craig and like you said, Habermas who will make historical cases for Christ and they'll say, yeah, like as you said, you know, make an abductive case. The best explanation for these facts that are agreed upon is that, you know, X, Y, Z, God Jesus rose from the dead and therefore Christianity is true, roughly. Um, and so as a tool for conversion, presuppositionalists tend to be extremely dismissive of those sorts of arguments. You know, and there's a couple of reasons for, for one, why would you need to appeal to abductive cases if you think you have this knockdown <laughs> deductive case, right? And then on the other, for the other, it's, it's almost I don't I don't know exactly I don't I don't want to you know psychologize, but there's there's definitely this push to say how does that make any sense, right? Because because they want to they want to really deny that there is any neutral ground. So that, again, the kind of the the, the, the the what what the evidentialist is doing is saying let's both use reason, let's both use um, you know, certain methods for making arguments, like an, let's make an abductive argument. Let's 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 look use these historical methods to establish an historical facts. And the and the presuppositionist doesn't want to grant that the non non Christian can even do that, right? They can't um, consistently look at historical data. They can't consistently make abductive arguments because they can't consistently accept the laws of logic or whatever and deny that God exists. And so so th there's like a there's like a, a kind of impatience that like no, you're not allowed to do that. Right, not consistently. You're already drawing from my view. Why, why even get into that? Because you're already drawing from my view. Um, and so, yeah. And and this is this is something Van Til says, and there's also something you'll see a lot in presuppositionalists. I mean, Van Til says something to the effect of, um, uh, even if God 
if, if we can show historically that Jesus rose from the dead, that doesn't even establish that he was divine, right? There could be alternative explanations. And that's true, right? And, and, and someone like Habermas or someone like Craig is going to admit that, and they're going to say, well, it just raises the probability of Christianity. And for most people, it'll be enough. If you think Jesus rose from the dead, you know, why, why posit the existence of aliens that raised him from the dead when you could just say that he was divine, right? It's just a more plausible explanation kind of overall. It's less ad hoc. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the presuppositionalist generally doesn't want to do that for, as an apologetic method. They, they just are impatient with that. I, I don't know then, like, once you are Christian, if they use that to kind of raise your credence or anything like that. I've, I've not seen that. Um, so I don't know if they did. I, 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 you know, it, again, if you think you have this totally knocked down certain deductive case, presumably you don't need that. You're already certain. <laughs> and that's, and that's, that tends to be how most presuppositionalists approach it. They think they're absolutely certain in their view. They, they couldn't be wrong. And so what would be the point of that? So, you know, maybe psychologically some want some more evidence. But uh, as far as I've seen, there's just not much of a role that that plays at all. They don't care about that. As, as again, as far as I've seen, that's in my experience. It's an anecdotal. Yeah, and uh, sometimes in my experience, like uh, a reformed Protestant will say, like, evidence does not bring you to faith. It's like uh, there was a debate between Stein, an atheist, and mm -hmm. Bonson, uh, of course, a presuppositionist. And mm -hmm. he ba basically, uh, Bonson from the get go said, like, he's not going to argue for the generic concept of God or the minimum facts thesis because a generic concept of God will still send you to hell. It's the Trinitarian <laughs> understanding of God. And, you know, you have to give him credit. Right. At, le at least he's willing sure. to, like, uh, put his cards out. Many people would not like that. But, no, uh, yeah, that's, that's very open. Yeah. 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 And you have to give him credit, like, he was one of the best presuppositionist apologetics out there. Uh, oh, sure, and he was a good debater. Yeah, oh, yeah, excellent debater. debater. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, there's very few people I would fear it to debate, but, like, if I had to debate Bonson, it's like, I would be wearing my pants, even if it's <laughs> Just because he's, he was an animal. Um, he was, like, yeah. basically, he, basically, what William Lane Craig is to debating these days is, like, what Bonson was. And I think yeah. Bonson was a better debater than Craig. So that should say something. Yeah, I, I think Bonson is, is, is probably... Um, I don't, maybe not largely, but a, a lot of the reason that, that presuppositionalism is, is as popular as it is is probably due to Barnson. He was a big popularizer of, of Van Til's work. And yeah, yeah, he, yeah. yeah. Big... Van Til was very dense, even if you knew yeah. Dutch. Um, it's still very <laughs> dense. But at least Barnson made it a bit more approachable in English, you know. Um, yes. But. Um, but yeah, for, in some cases, like, say, James White, for instance, had a uh, discussion with. Um, Anderson, uh, Stephen Anderson, the crazy King James Onlyist, and he basically was arguing, uh, discussing like the biblical prophecy and evidence, and he mm -hmm. White basically agreed with on Anderson, like it doesn't bring you to faith, it doesn't prove the Bible, but for those who are regenerated, like it adds like say one's appreciation mm -hmm. and confidence in their faith, but it's not the foundation that they should be uh that should be used as an apologetic device because like it could you could be wrong and so forth, you know, um about like these kind of historical issues. So, right. Yeah, I, I know. I, I suppose I imagine many presuppositionalists would say it would be almost irrational to get you from non-belief to belief on those grounds because it would be based on contradictory premises, right? So, so it's yeah. I, I think uh, uh, at the very least, they'd have to say that it's with it once you're once you're already once you've already accepted the kind of certain view of God that, that would be at all useful. But again, I've not really seen much of that. No, fair enough. Um... Okay, so that's, uh, so maybe if we were to like go into like uh, how a Latter-day Saint would respond to say some of the relatively better arguments, and one of the ones mm -hmm. is like, well, you know, uh, a presuppositionist uh, perspective, the, you know, quote-unquote biblical, uh, i.e. Calvinistic worldview, best explains what logic is, what the laws of logic are, and they can mm -hmm. go and justify them. So like, um, how would you, because like you're, you have a philosoph philosophical background, so uh, what is logic, what are the laws of logic, and how would you as a Latter-day Saint, um, justify and ground logic when that kind of yeah. uh, Latter-day Saint worldview. Sure. So, okay. So, so maybe the first thing I would say is that one reason, for instance, to say that the Anderson Welty line, this idea that uh, laws of logic are necessary truths, they're ideas and they have to be necessary ideas in the mind of God. One reason maybe to think that there's something suspicious going on there is that um, what does it mean to say ideas in the mind of God if you take a pretty hardline classical theist view. So if, if you think that God is simple, absolutely simple, um, he has no parts whatsoever. So like we're, we're complex beings. We, I, I have a mind and then within that kind of a separate thing that mind are certain thoughts, right? So like um, my thought um, that presuppositionalism is false, if I'm thinking that right now, is separate from me, it's separate from my mind, it's something my mind is doing, it's going through my mind and it changes, right? So I didn't have that thought before actively and then I have it after. Maybe I kind of, persistently have this belief that it's false or something um but if god is simple and he doesn't have any parts i don't know in what so so you know if, if you take a strong view of simplicity 
all talk of God is analogical. This is a kind of Aquinas thing, the essential an analogy thesis, as William Alston puts it. Um, so it's not literally true to say that God has a mind. It's like different but related. Uh, there's a different but related notion of mind, I guess, that we we don't we don't we can't really clearly articulate. And that's what's true of God when we say that God has a mind. Um, but if if God can't have thoughts in the same way that we have thoughts, because again, thoughts introduce complexity. I'm not simple in part because my thoughts are separate from me. In what sense can God have thoughts, right? I, I, I can't make sense. If you, think, if you think God is absolutely simple, I can't make sense of saying that God has thoughts. And some of those thoughts are the laws of logic because that has to be simple. He can't have thoughts in anything like, in, like the way we have them. Um, and so then that leads people like William and Craig to deny, because he, he wants to say that like abstract objects, you know, something that, uh, roughly like thoughts in the mind of God. And, and yeah, I, I can't make sense of that in simplicity, right? So that's, that's one reason to think there's something wrong there. Um, so, you know, how do we account for logic? Well, you know, there's all sorts of ways um, that you could try to, to go. So, so as far as like what laws of logic are, um, Frege has a line where he basically says uh, they're the most general kinds of description. So we have laws of nature and then the laws of the laws of nature are the laws of logic, maybe something like that, right? They're just, so I, I, don't, I don't want to say, it seems very strange to me to say that the laws of logic exist as like things in themselves, as these like laws that constrain other things. It seems to make more sense to me to say that they are just the, the most general kind of description. I describe reality and I can't get more general than describing it in terms of the laws of logic, right? It's the law of non-contradiction. Uh, it couldn't be the case that A and not A. It's just a description of, 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 of kind of particular facts. It's a very general kind of, of description. You know, this thing is, uh, this, this tree outside my window exists and it can't also be true that it doesn't exist, right? Um, so that's one way of kind of talking about what laws of logic are. And that's an alternative to say that there are their thoughts in the mind of God. And, you know, there, there are maybe various reasons to think that that's, that's the best way to think about logic. There have been alternative views, right? Like um, uh, Putnam, who's a philosophical hero of mine, says that uh, Kant, for instance, thought they were just like laws of thought, but then Kant didn't want to get too far into like, do they obtain in the numinal realm? Um, but yes, yeah, so then how, how do we account for them? It's basically, how because if, if the presuppositionist wants to say that I'm not allowed to use laws of logic without presupposing God, how do I say that I'm allowed to use the laws of logic? How am I entitled to use them if I don't presuppose that, right? Because I don't, I, the Latter-day Saint conception of God tends to be a lot more finitistic, right? We have this like embodied corporeal God. Most Latter-day Saints, at least lay Latter-day Saints, think that God had a God and at one time wasn't God. So it would be pretty much nonsense to say that the laws of logic depend on our God, who isn't necessarily God, right? He's contingently God. So, you know, how do we account for that? Well, I, I don't want to be super committed on ontologically explaining laws of logic. I don't really have super strong views on that. I think they probably are just the most general kind of description. Um, but in terms of like epistemologically, epistemically, how do I think I'm entitled to accept them? Uh, well, basically, uh, again, Putnam, who's, who's my philosophical hero, he, he has this line where he says, uh, you know, this line of thinking, basically the broad argument is um, certain things we can't make sense of being false. And if we can't make sense of them being false, kind of methodologically we're entitled to accept them and so so you know that's well i don't, I don't maybe i shouldn't go there but yeah I, I, it's, it's more complicated than that and it's more compelling than that. <laughs> maybe that's not very compelling if you just barely assert that there's a lot more in the background for Putnam, kind of this idea of conceptual schemes um but if i couldn't if i if i literally can't make sense of being wrong about the law of non contradiction i can't make sense of saying that something can be true and not true at the same time i have no idea what that says that seems like gibberish to me that I'm entitled to accept that the law of non-contradiction obtains, that I'm allowed to use it, you know, in kind of an epistemic setting uh, to, to, to reason and things like that, because I can't make sense of anything else. So, you know, and, and maybe that maybe that just kind of brackets the ontological question. Maybe I'm saying, maybe they depend on God, maybe they don't, but regardless, I'm allowed to use them in my worldview, because I, I literally can't make sense of any alternative. And, and, and that probably won't be very convincing to a, to a um, presuppositionalist. Um, but as far as just giving a coherent account of my own views, and again, there's a lot, it's a lot more convincing when you know more about Putnam. Um, like I'm, I'm totally happy with that. <laughs> that's enough for me, right? To say that I'm entitled epistemically, and that, that, that's kind of needs to be very specific. I'm, I'm, I'm epistemically licensed to use those based on that. It's rational for me to do so. Um, then that's enough for me. I'm, I'm fine to say that's how the laws of logic are justified in my worldview, right? Okay, no, that's good, um, because, like, the appeal to, like, say, the use of logic um, and the existence of logic and what logic is, that's always, like, a go-to apologetic you often right. find, at least amongst the online presuppositionists, like, say, a Cy Ten Bruggenkate in these debate against Matt Delahunty and Atheist, if you've ever seen that, um, 
interesting enough. I don't think I have. Uh, it, it, it was it was as crazy as you would expect it to be. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, one other, one thing though is like uh the the one and the many. Now you often hear like from presuppositionists, especially those who are like um um you know typical trinitarian and so forth. Like say, of course, uh, the Trinity explains the one and the many, but even presenting from like say the Trinity and the truth thereof, you know, and so forth. Um. Is there an actual problem in philosophy about the one and the many, or is this like a um, an invented problem um, um, that presuppositionists answer? Like uh, they have they have an answer looking for a question, if you will, like they're working backwards. And if there is, like, how would a Latter Day Saint, uh, or at least how would you, as an informed Latter Day Saint, right. approach the one and the many dilemma, if if there is such a thing? Yeah. So. It's it's a problem that like the, you know the ancient Greeks grappled with this problem. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not totally clear on what the problem is supposed to be. I'll be honest. You know, the idea is something like there it, it, multiplicity exists, like distinctions and things exist, and maybe there's some some sense in, in which there's oneness. The universe is one thing, and how do we account for that? And and I'm going to be honest when I hear that that is supposed to be a problem. <laughs> I kind of shrug. I don't. I don't, I, I don't and, and, and maybe, maybe that's because I am in a philosophical tradition. I, I'm kind of in a philosophical context that's very. I, I, I am in the contemporary philosophical scene. That's mostly what I've read. I, I do some history of philosophy, but mostly I'm kind of in the, in the contemporary stuff. You know, and, and so broadly in analytic philosophy, maybe broadly uh, um, naturalist in a very broad sense. Um, and so it, it's just not the sort of thing that I see as being something that needs explaining. And I think maybe if you're in a kind of an ancient Greek context, or maybe even a medieval context, where you have certain views of what the world is like, you know, like, so, so like, you know, Plato is in part, for instance, responding to Parmenides, who says that there are no distinctions in anything, right? All distinctions fall away. And, you know, so people like um, Michael de la Roca argue this is based on the principle of sufficient reason. If we're to satisfy the principle of sufficient reason, then everything has to be a total unity, undifferentiated unity. There's no distinctions between anything. Um, and, and and so maybe if you're responding to that, you, you you want to be able to give an answer to this sort of problem, uh, but it frankly it's not something that's particularly. I mean, so like you know, Mariology, the idea of like parts and that sort of thing is short, so that's that's a part of of contemporary metaphysics. People like Peter van Eeuwijk and talk about you know manyness and and, and uh, you know David Lewis that sort of thing. But as far as like how um, presuppositionalists tend to talk about the problem of the one the many, it's not true <laughs> that it's some perennial persistent incontrovertible problem of philosophy um and it's just yeah i think i think most contemporary philosophers if you say but what about the problem with the many one of the many and you account for that in your worldview they're going to give you kind of an incredulous stare right that's just not not sure what the problem is exactly supposed to be like sure they're just the universe is one thing in the sense that we can describe it as one thing and there are many things in the sense that there are lots of arrangements of atoms that make up things we call objects and then you can have a theory of what what it means for the object maybe it's just something that that matter does, or maybe it's maybe it's its own thing in some significance. We're cutting nature at the joints, whatever. But yeah, I, I just <laughs> I don't know what the problem is supposed to be. What's what's wrong with <laughs> so, with so, that being so? So, so be fair to say, like at least how it's presented, it's a solution looking for a problem. I, I think I think if you're if in if you think that a contemporary philosophical um, kind of system needs to be answering this question, and the most plausible kinds of answers are things like saying. God is three persons in one being. Uh, then yes, I think it's a, I think it's a solution looking for a problem. I'll be honest. I, I think it's a way of extending the tag argument to try to incorporate specifically Christian rather than just classical theist doctrines. Um, yeah, I, I just I don't I don't see there being much there that's like a serious challenge to Latter Day Saints. I don't think it's people think something people need to be worried about at all. Yeah, uh, it does seem like the tag argument is used to like um, to support any concept the reform Protestant believes in. Um, you know, he, I'm not going to name him because I don't want to like. Uh, seem like I'm shouting them out, but like, I call him out, but like a uh, friend of ours and someone who you've debated in another debate that he had, like tried using the tag curve to uh, prove uh, biblical sufficiency in the 66 book uh, prose and canon. And that was like a, um, that, that I, I have to admit, like I've seen tag used uh, many times, I've never liked to uh, show the 66 prose and book canon. Yeah, that, I'm sure not much and other opponents of the council, Trent, would have loved to have access to that. <laughs> oh yeah, right. <laughs> that would have been helpful. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Um, so you kind of mentioned like uh, previous, like um, you know, you don't have to be a reformed Protestant to be a presuppositionist, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned like maybe with some qualifications, even the Latter Day Saint could be a presuppositionist. Now, of course, like there's no 
uh, teleological perspective or no philosophical perspective that's necessarily like 100% wrong or you can't glean good teens out of. Mm -hmm. So uh, could a Latter-day Saint be consistently a presuppositionist? If so, how? And even like, even allowing for like, say, the incorrect or falsity of presuppositionism as a whole, what are the positives or like the good teens mm -hmm. uh, emphasize when typical standard presuppositionism, you know, that a Latter-day Saints can actually have appreciate and maybe even glean from if they could? Yeah. So, so I think when I say that a lot of this thing can be a presuppositionalist, I think uh, a standard presuppositionalist is going to bristle at that, right? Because they do they do want to say that it's it's dependent on certain features of God that Latter-day Saints don't accept. We don't accept that God can't change. We don't accept that God can't be causally affected by the universe. We don't accept that God is simple, right? We don't accept that God is immaterial. And so what I mean is basically you could take, so in, in natural theology, this idea that we can observe, basically we can, we can know things about God uh, without special revelation that's kind of the project of natural theology and so you'll have arguments like the kalam argument the ontological argument right they're saying let's look at something in, in reality oh the fact that the universe has to be finite uh you know god is a, a good explanation for that essentially so natural theology maybe one argument you could give and this is a fairly popular argument is um kind of the argument from moral truths right it's it is true let's say that it's wrong to torture a child uh you know so how do we account for that fact and so generally i think today in philosophy of religion, an argument like that is going to be abductive. It's going to say the best explanation for that is going to be uh, that that God exists. That's going to be the best explanation for why there are moral truths. And maybe we think it's uncontroversial or, or clearer that there are moral truths. And so, sure, like uh, a lot of they say can make that argument. I think a lot of they think sometimes have made those sorts of arguments. And you don't have to make it abductively. Maybe you could make it transcendentally, right? So the, the difference between these two sets of argument: one says here are facts. The best explanation for that fact is God. Transcendental arguments say here's a fact or here are facts those facts presuppose God, right? And so it's maybe a little bit kind of a, a stronger argument. And so sure, like if that's all presuppositionalism is, which is not really, but it, it, you know, that kind of transcendental argument, which I think is the core of presuppositionalism, a lot of think can make that kind of argument. And maybe you could even do that with, the, with regard to reason or order in the universe or rationality or logic. I think maybe some of those are a little bit less likely because we have such a finitistic view of God. But many Latter-day Saints uh, do think that morality in some way depends on God or gods. Uh, and sure, then you could make something like a tag argument from morality if you wanted to. Um, personally, I don't put much stock in that. I don't. I don't think um, that natural theology does much for us. I, and that's because I largely depend on a, kind of the standard like to say, revelatory epistemology. I think it's really witness of the spirit that is what should convince us that God is real, and not arguments, right? And, and there's lots of reason to think that, right? Like. like did people so if you think that the only rational way to believe in god is through arguments did did you know the earliest christians have arguments the existence of god did you know some christian peasant in the middle ages we're we going to say that they didn't rationally believe or or a christian in a country that doesn't have access to these arguments like you know a, a, a chinese christian who's never read the ontological argument are they irrational in believing in god i don't want to say that right um that seems like a strange thing and, and, and most latter-day saints uh, most most christians let's say uh don't read arguments and many of them aren't probably competent to understand the arguments, right? If you have someone who's just is, is not going to be able to follow the ontological argument, which can be quite complex. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to say that don't we rationally believe. And so, I, I, you know, um, and so one way you can get around that is to say that, well, if they've had a witness of the spirit, then they can rationally believe. So, so the, I think there's advantages of that view. Um, but so one thing that, you, you know, you want to know something that's good about presuppositionalism. I think um, one good thing is the sort of attitude it can instill, right? This idea that you don't have to give ground to the non-believer in certain ways in order to, to accept that you, to, 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 to think that your view is rational. So we, we live in a, in a world that's very heavily influenced by this kind of view that scientific values should be the model for all cognitive values, right? Or um, scientific evidence is the only way to know things. But there's this kind of like, kind of <laughs> positivism, logical positivism that kind of pervades uh, lay views. Even the logical positivism in philosophy is largely dead. This view that, that, that you know, maybe science is the only way to know truths or, you know, to know, um, the only truths that are meaningful are ones that can be verified where verified means kind of specific. That's, that's pretty popular. I would say amongst a lot of kind of lay persons who are interested, maybe atheists in particular. Right. And so, um, yeah, I, I think the kind of attitude of, well, I don't have to prove it on those grounds that, that logical, that, sorry, that, um, presuppositionalism, suggests that i think is a good thing because for latter-day saints in particular we, we're not we don't tend to be evidentialists we don't take the william lane craig line of saying here's the kalam argument therefore god exists here's the you know historical uh, case of the resurrection therefore christianity 
we tend to just say... And, and, and of course, like, as the early saints, we would reject the Kalam argument anyway. Right, I mean, that's incompatible with that. Yeah, right. just, just on the Kalam argument, uh, you have, like, uh, a video on this on your LDS philosophy I do, page, yeah. And also, our mutual friend, Blake Oster, has done a lot of work against... He's done an excellent... Yeah, he has an excellent I just thought, I just thought yeah. I'd plug that while you uh, mentioned this. Thank you. Yeah, no, there's that's, that's, that's some very, very good resources um, on, on why the Kalam is wrong, because it's, yeah, if it, if it says that the past is in, it's finite, and we, we tend... I think we're pretty much committed to saying the past is infinite. Um, so it's an argument for the existence of God that would disprove the Latter-day Saint view, roughly speaking, or at least a commitment that we tend to, to accept. So yeah, so um, we don't tend to give arguments for why we think God is right. And so, and so you know, you do see things like uh, an argument. So, so you know, uh, some Latter-day Saints do an argument for the for the resurrection of Jesus. A lot more often, though, you'll see things like Joseph Smith couldn't have produced the Book of Mormon on his own. Therefore, maybe the Latter-day Saint view is more likely, right? So that's kind of almost like uh, you know, it, it's an evidentialist case, maybe for like the same view, um, and, and and you do see people making that, but lo- by and large, I think people. I, so I I think sometimes the impulse to give something like an argument for you know against a naturalistic explanation of the Book of Mormon, I think the impulse is sometimes that we want to feel like we can justify our views on scientific grounds. And I don't think we need to, and I think I think that's one of the good things about presuppositionalism is to show that we don't need to be able to do that. And I, it's not exactly in a presuppositionalist way because what I'm saying is. I'm rationally justified by my spiritual experiences, but those are not, not communicable. I can't prove to you that I've had those or anything like that. And therefore it's not going to rationally convince you. Um, and so that's in a lot of ways, not, not in the spirit of presuppositionalism, which is very much in the, I can convince you because you're wrong. Um, but that, that idea that we don't have to, we don't have to look at this neutral ground and say that I can justify myself from the ground up. I think that's right. I think we, we as individuals, can rely on our spiritual experiences without being able to convince other people that the church is true. And that's fine. And that, 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 in many ways, it's actually better. It's a good thing. And so that's, that's one thing I do admire about presuppositionalism. Um, I mean, it's a fun view, you know, it, it is just, it is just fun. I, I can totally see the appeal. It's just fun to be able to be like, actually everything else is wrong demonstrably. That's cool. You know, um, uh, I, I just, I don't, I don't find presuppositionalism particularly compelling, um, but you're right. That doesn't mean there's nothing to like about it. Um, and, I, I'm, and I'm not going to say that, I don't understand why people uh, like it. It would be very nice to have that kind of certainty in a lot of yeah, ways. And, and to be fair, like if you believe in say, the reformed understanding of say, the noetic effects of the fall until depravity and um, other aspects that, of historic reformed theology, uh, presuppositionalism kind of remains true. You know, like how can you actually be an evidentialist or like sure. some other non presup model if you believe? even the elect are like totally depraved and uh, even once they're regenerated like um and no longer totally depraved they still have the noetic effects of the fall their epistemologically fallen you know um so like it, there is like a i can understand like why we in a reform perspective like there is like a logic to, yeah there's a kind of impetus there to accept that sort yeah. of view you're absolutely right yeah yeah so like you know it's it's not like i don't think like it's a stupid perspective even if it's dead wrong you know there is a certain <laughs> logic to it yeah you know, yeah it's like, right of course, like Calvinism is unbiblical. So, you know, that's, mm. for me, that's a different perspective. That's a biblical exegetical perspective. But even from a philosophical perspective, there's problems with it. But at the same time, there is, if you accept like some of the uh, assumptions, it doesn't actually flow, if you will. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not going to pretend there aren't pretty sophisticated, you know, kind of relatively speaking. It's not like there are, you know, there are no first rate philosophers who endorse presuppositionalism. But as far as like amateur or philosophically trained people who are, you know, sophisticated for the most part they, they give a coherent account there are presuppositionalists who are like that there are of course also plenty that that you know are just spouting nonsense but um yeah it's it, you know it, it is it is a coherent position you can make can give right as long as you're, you're doing it carefully i just think it's wrong and i think it's it's pretty clearly wrong most of the time but it, but it, you know, that, that's not to say that you can't be rational and be a presuppositionalist right and because it's so rare like it ca- does kind of catch a lot of people uh, off guards and kind of seem like um very very compelling the very first time sure. you come across it like like the yeah. alarm argument you know or the tag yeah. argument it's like the very first time one encounters that it's like okay this you just kind of know there's something wrong but like you can't put your finger on it it seems like at face value like really compelling if it holds up you know yeah yeah if, if, if you don't know much about philosophy and you come across the kind of like i said the anderson wealthy argument that, that that laws of logic are thoughts and they have to be the mind of god of course you're not going to know how how and why that goes wrong right like <laughs> and that's going to look very compelling right and sure i, I you know I, I totally see why why that is um something people are drawn to i don't i don't begrudge people that at all but that's you know i think that's why it's good that you're doing things like this where you have uh, you want to give people resources on on 
what it is and where it goes wrong because it is yeah, uh, because, because not everyone has the time yeah, because the like, desire, I heard these interactions with like say reformed theology I do quite a bit you know but sure right reformed presuppositionalism I'm unaware of like any good resource so hopefully this would be like a very good entree into it and like I'm hoping like a Calvinist who's a presuppositionist will recognize presuppositionalism in this you know even if you're yeah I, I don't I hope time, I haven't like, LD, <laughs> misrepresented and grossly like, right LDS will like be able to like respond to like say the by what standard argument and deal right. with the common tropes but um we've covered a lot but like uh, before we end um any suggested resources for and against uh presuppositionalism uh one one resource i will try out and it may not be for like a good entree but at the same time like if you want to dig deep would be um van Til's apologetic it's um if you're familiar with what a study bible is where you have the biblical text and then like say the interpretation or the exegesis it's basically the it's like that for like a presup apologetics you have stacked drawings of van Til on the resurrection and letters mm -hmm with an atheist and an Arminian about like how to prove the resurrection of Christ and so forth. And then Bonson's interpretive note. So um, you probably like the two best presuppositionists ever, you know, in one volume. And it's about 800 pages, but um, that may not be the best entree into your presuppositionalism beyond this episode, but um, maybe one to like um, to aim for if you want to delve deep into this topic. But um, any, yeah, any recommended resources you would say like for or against? So presupposition is interesting again because in, in part because today it's not uh an academic thing it's kind of a grassroots thing in many ways even though you know van Til was obviously publishing books on this and there are still books published on this so there's not like really uh, frankly a lot of the content most of the content on this is amateur blog posts and on amateur youtube videos right in, in terms of defending presupposition frankly right and so you have kind of classics um, from the tradition, Van Til's Christian Apologetics or his Defense of the Faith, right? You've got books by Greg, Greg Bonson and John Frame. I don't remember the books off the top of my head. Um, and, you know, I've got, I've got a handful of those. Um, yeah, John, John uh, Frame, like, the Doctrine of God and his other volumes. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, and so, yeah, if, if, you, if you want to understand the, 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 the kind of presuppositionalist position in detail, you, you would need to read those sorts of books, right? Because those are, those are the kind of standard texts. Although, Van Til is interesting because uh, in a lot of ways, he doesn't. What we've talked about here today is all there, but very abstract. He doesn't really get into the details. He doesn't explain in detail the transcendental argument, for instance. He kind of talks around it a lot, and so it was up to like people like Bunsen and Frame uh, and Gordon Clark to get into more details on that. And so, yeah, I mean, you, you're going to see a lot of blog posts. You're going to see a lot of YouTube videos by people who are into presuppositionalist apologetics. And then again, you, I, you know, I've, I've mentioned a few times that that paper by. Um, uh, Anderson and, and Welty, uh, the, Lord, the Lord of Non-Contradiction, published in Phil uh, Philosophy of Christie. Um, and, and that's that's kind of what's out there, is, is that you have these kind of amateur things, and you have these these kind of standard books in history. And then, you, you know, of course, you're going to have more, I don't know many of the kind of more recent books that, that kind of take a presuppositionalist line. Um, but I, I, I guess I don't know of any good, like, nice introductory resource. And John Frame has a lot of essays um, kind of laying out presuppositionalism, um, uh, I, I, I don't, yeah, I, Frank, sorry, I, I guess I don't, I don't, I don't know of any particularly uh, good resource that is like looking, laying out the position. There's just so many different arguments in, in kind of different ways of making the tag argument. So, so like, yeah, the, the Anderson Welty is fine as far as like a, an attempt at a philosophically rigorous uh, laying out of a kind of tag argument. That's that's a good paper for that. And then Van Til is kind of the classic. Classicus Locus, right? And uh, yeah, he's got lots of books. Christian Apologetics is a good one, I think, to start with, probably, as far as Van Til goes. Oh, no, that's perfect. Um, before we end the episode, um, any other uh, following comments on this issue? And also, like, are you working on any other projects at the moment outside, like, say, of course, your forthcoming study for the PhD and the future dissertation? Uh, so I'm uh, working on a video on uh, Orson Pratt's philosophy. So he was kind of, well, he was the first Latter day Saint philosopher. And he's got a really fun system. It's really interesting. He's drawing really heavily from uh, British philosophers, kind of the British empiricist Newtonian tradition. Um, and, you know, so so some of what he relies on is uh, just kind of outdated Newtonian science, uh, but, but kind of within that framework, and even independent of it, he's got some really interesting, fun things to say. He was actually quite sophisticated, particularly for being totally kind of an autodidact when it comes to philosophy. Um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. So I'll do a video kind of outlining his whole metaphysics and his view of God, uh, hopefully within the next month. I, I'm I'm not very good at keeping up with that. I've got a wife and two kids, and <laughs> so I don't always keep up on these things. And then at some point, uh, maybe what I'll do is a, a video kind of broadly outlining 
uh, natural theology in relation to the Latte Saint view, which we kind of talked about how I, I don't I don't put much stock in natural theology, right? This idea that we can know a lot about God without revelation. So like argue with the season of God. Many of them are actually incompatible with Latte Saint view. We mentioned the Kalam argument, right? It just is flatly incompatible with with what most Latter-day Saints are gonna say about the, the infinitude of the past. Uh, so maybe I'll do like a kind of a, a, a video outlining so that and, and I think um, maybe have Tarek Lakur on to talk about I think he's a little bit more open to natural theology than I am. So maybe we'll talk about Latter Saint natural theology after I make that video. Um, that's probably all I have in the works specifically for the for the channel. For oh, my, no, YouTube channel and just with respect to say Tark the Core, uh, if for those who uh, are on YouTube, just type in Tark the Core and natural theology. He's a presentation from the Fair Conference from last right. year. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That he's more open. Theology is on there. Yeah. I even get a shout out as well. Um, um, Tark is a bit of a determinist, and uh, I'm a bit of. I'm not a bit, I'm actually pretty open, but unintended about being an open taste. So like, um, we've had our twos and fro's about that, but um, <laughs> he called me out in a very friendly way during the uh, presentation <laughs> when I was there. So uh, that, was, that was fun. <laughs> yeah. But no, that that would be good. And especially like having, uh, because both you and Tark are uh, smart cookies um, when it comes to philosophy, it would be very interesting to have like an interaction on that natural theology. So um, I'm looking forward to that in the Orson Pratt video. Um, Apart from having the best beard of the restoration, Baron, on, um, <laughs> he, he was a very smart guy. And what I yeah. liked is like how he incorporated a lot of, say, non LDS scholarship and philosophy into his writings. You know, like yeah. H. Roberts as well, who would be my patron saint if LDS had patron saints. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, um, uh, Pratt was the best till B. H. Roberts. So I, I'll look at B. H. Roberts eventually, but I'll do Pratt first. <laughs> well, to be fair, I am biased. I do work for an organization that he's named after H. Roberts. True. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But uh, no, Joseph, again, um, thank you for your time. It's greatly appreciated. And um, as I said, like, there's not, there hasn't been that many LDS interactions with presuppositionalism, which is why I thought I'd bring you on, because you've dealt with uh, presuppositionalist apologists in the past, and of course, because of your philosophical background. So hopefully, at the very least, this will be a very good entree for like LDS to know what presuppositionalism is, and also be able to answer uh, some of the common uh, arguments raised by presuppositionists uh, when Latter-day Saints interact with them. Um, because, of course, like most of our theological critics are from a Calvinistic bent, and of course, this yeah. is a popular win Calvinism. So hopefully this will be a very good resource, and hopefully we can have you on again in the near future to discuss any other topics uh, you're working on as well. Sure. Uh, so yeah, again. But, uh, thanks again for having me. No, my pleasure. Uh, and thanks again. Really appreciate it. And um, thank you.